Okay, everyone, I think uh, we'll get started in the interest of time. Uh, so for those of you that don't know me, I'm, my name is Christian. I'm one of the uh, fifth-year Emerge residents here at Ottawa, and I'm pleased to talk to you today about uh, skin and soft tissue infections in the emergency department. Before going any further, I'd like to just acknowledge a few people that were key to this talk. Uh, Dr. Eagles for supervising this talk and uh, gave some great feedback regarding the content that you'll see today. Uh, Drs. Uh, Sue and Rose from the Division of Infectious Disease at the Ottawa Hospital. Uh, Dr. Sue is the current director of the TOH OPAC clinic. Dr. Rose is my current thesis supervisor, and they're both involved in infection control and hospital epidemiology. And then also Drs. Nath and McCall, who were uh, instrumental in some of the elements of the presentation itself. So before going any further, let's talk about exactly what uh, some of the key objectives are and what you're going to be able to take away from this talk today. First thing we're going to talk about are necrotizing infections, and we'll look at what uh, the evidence is behind using any kind of tangible score, such as the Elronex system, uh, for making this critical diagnosis. We'll then move forward to talk about MRSA, specifically community-acquired MRSA. So I'm going to present some local data uh, regarding the increasing burden uh, of this uh, disease and to also discuss what are the latest trials and some novel therapies that have come out in the last year. And these are some landmark trials that I think are important to discuss. The third point, I think, is probably the most fascinating for emergency physicians, and that is who, who actually requires admission to hospital for this uh, disease process, and who requires IV antibiotics. And so I'm going to supplement some of this uh, information with survey data from my own resident research project to hopefully answer some questions. And then I'll uh, finish up by talking about the OPAT clinic uh, at the Ottawa Hospital and some upcoming research uh, that will be coming to the Ottawa Hospital. So to start off, I think I'd like to just go through some background information just to illustrate why I think this is such an important talk for you to listen to today. So if you open any textbook uh, related to cellulitis or soft tissue infections, you're likely to come across a diagram like this. And I just think it's a nice illustration to show that all the way from erysipelas to something like myonecrosis, it's really just related to the depth of involvement. So erysipelas is isolated to the epidermal layer. Cellulitis involves the dermis and the subcutaneous tissue, whereas necrotizing fasciitis, of, co of course, uh, occurs the, at the level of the fascia. So what exactly is the disease burden at the Ottawa Hospital? Well, well in 2014, we saw almost 2,300 unique visits for cellulitis or uh, erysipelas. What I mean by unique visits is that this excludes patients that are brought back to the emergency department for the same presentation. Uh, and so this actually uh, approximates to about 2 to 3 percent of all emergency department visits at the Ottawa <coughs> Hospital. So it's a significant proportion of our population. And strikingly, and I'll go into some more details about this later on, the treatment failure rate based on Canadian data still sits at 18 to 20.5 percent. Uh, so that's actually quite high, and that, what that suggests to me is that there's ample room for research to hopefully improve these numbers. So what about the epidemiology of skin and soft tissue infections with our American neighbors? So this is a, take, a figure taken from Rosen's, but actually came from a study by Pallet and co-workers from uh, the Annals of Emergency Medicine. And uh, just to help you focus in on what are the salient points of this uh, diagram, the smooth lines represent physician offices in the outpatient setting, and the dotted lines represent the emergency department setting. So if you focus in on the smooth orange line, you can see that the total proportion of patients from the early 90s to the mid-2000s did not change in the outpatient setting. Yet if you focus on the green dotted line, what you can see is that the proportion of emergency department visits over this same time frame did increase. So this is why it's important to us, is that the burden in the emergency department setting is continuing to grow. So extrapolated from that previous slide, what we can say is that the annual U.S. emergency department visit rate uh, for skin and soft tissue infections actually tripled over this time frame. Between 2008 and 2010, there were approximately half a million annual U.S. hospitalizations for this infection. And if you're wondering what exactly is the cost to the system for admitting just one patient with an SSTI, that's approximately $8,000 U.S. dollars with a mean length of stay of five days. So I think we can all agree that this is certainly a very important thing to discuss today and to see where we can make some improvements using the evidence. You might also be wondering, well, what exactly is the best treatment for cellulitis? And so Kilburn and colleagues released a Cochrane Systematic Review in 2010. They identified 25 randomized controlled trials. Unfortunately, no two trials looked at the same antibiotics. And so they were basically not able to conclude what exactly is the optimal therapy for skin and soft tissue infections. <clears throat> 
An interesting point is that they actually identified two randomized control trials that compared oral versus IV antibiotics, something that I think as emergency physicians we're all interested in. When they pulled the results, surprisingly, oral antibiotics were superior to IV antibiotics, so that's just some food for thought. And what do the guidelines actually tell us regarding skin and soft tissue infections? Well, Dennis Stevens and uh, co-workers put together an expert panel and released an update to the IDSA guidelines in 2014. They used the grade scheme, and if anybody's unfamiliar with what that is, basically uh, it just grades the level of the quality of evidence and the level of the quality of the overall recommendation as uh, weak, moderate, or strong. And as you can see, the quality of the evidence throughout this review was mostly moderate to low. The authors of this um, guideline did put together an algorithm for management of, of skin and soft tissue infections. This is hopefully just going to be the most complex slide in the whole talk, but I'm kind of glad it came across this way in the guidelines because I think we all think of cellulitis as a seemingly uh, simple disease process, but this clearly shows that this is otherwise the case. So I'm going to walk you through some of the key features of this diagram. What the authors are trying to get at first is that you should be able to differentiate between mild, moderate, and severe uh, cellulitis. So in mild cases, this is just your simple run-of-the-mill cellulitis. For moderate cases, this is the same thing with the addition of SERS criteria. So if you have two or more SERS criteria, you'd be considered moderate. And for, for severe, they classify it as you either being immunocompromised, although they never really expand on what exactly that is, or if you have obvious signs of deep tissue infection, so things like sloughing, bullet, or crepitus. So now that you understand what the difference in severity is, and I should point out also that there's no universally accepted way of grading the severity of cellulitis, you can then split it into purulent versus non-purulent cellulitis. So if you focus on the right-hand side of the screen, these are purulent skin and soft tissue infections. What I find interesting about this is that they recommend antibiotics for moderate or severe purulent infections. If you're a purist and if you really believe the literature, you can argue that actually for abscesses, incision and drainage is all that is required and you do not require antibiotics. So just an interesting point. If you then move over um, to non-purulent skin and soft tissue infections, I think this is also interesting. So if you have a healthy male, who base, a healthy young male who has maybe a heart rate of 95 and a white blood cell count of 13,000, if you follow these guidelines, they recommend IV antibiotic therapy. But I would argue that many of us as clinicians using your clinical judgment might actually offer oral antibiotic therapy. So while this does serve as a guideline, it's perhaps a little bit too confusing and uh, a little bit too stringent in terms of uh, what they recommend. So I thought I'd simplify things for you. I put together my own little algorithm in terms of how I think we as emergency clinicians approach skin and soft tissue infections. In my opinion, there are really three decision tree dilemmas. The first is the diagnosis, and I think what we're all concerned about is, is this a necrotizing infection or not, because it is a can't miss diagnosis. If it's necrotizing, it's simple, because you know that the management's going to be early surgical debridement, broad spectrum IV antibiotic therapy, and admission to the ICU. Once you've made the decision that this is not likely to be a necrotizing infection, the next dilemma is twofold. First of all, you have to know, am I selecting the appropriate antibiotic? And this is, uh, this is compounded by the fact that MRSA is becoming an increasing burden in our community. So you, if you think that this patient has uh, or is likely to have MRSA, you want to give the appropriate antibiotics. And then it's further compounded by the big question, which is who actually needs parenteral therapy or who needs oral antibiotic therapy? If you choose IV antibiotics, your final decision is disposition. So should we be admitting these patients? Can they simply go home and have CCAC follow-up? Is there an OPAT clinic in my community that I can refer them to? Or should they return to the emergency department? And if they should return, when should they be reassessed? So the remainder of this talk is going to focus on these three decision points. And so we'll start off with the first case. So this is a 25-year-old male. He's completely healthy, and he comes in with three days of right hand pain and swelling. And I think you'll appreciate that there's maybe a small black eschar on the dorsum of the hand there. Um, his uh, vitals are stable. He is tender over the dorsum of the hand, but not out of proportion. There's no crepitus and no bullet on your physical examination. So I'd just like to poll the audience here. Who would actually would order any kind of blood work for this patient? Hands up if, you're, if, you, if you'd order blood work. So one person in the room. Who would order any kind of radiography? So would you order maybe a plain x-ray, CT scan? Would anybody order any kind of radiography? So raise your hands if you do that. Okay, so we're a pretty conservative group here, so nobody would order any, any further investigations. Uh, who would order um, oral antibiotics for this patient? Raise your hands. 
So most patients would say oral antibiotics. Who would order IV antibiotics for this patient? And so I've got a handful, mostly staff, that are saying IV antibiotics. That's interesting. So because you're in the US, you did get some imaging. And uh, the only thing really to point out here is that there's really just significant soft tissue swelling on the dorsum of the hand. There's certainly no concerning features, right? So there's no drainable collection that you can see. And there's certainly no soft tissue gas. So this patient was put on IV antibiotics and asked to return to the emergency department for uh, further, further antibiotics. And so they returned 36 hours later in septic shock. So this is taken from an actual case report from the New England Journal. The, the, the leftmost picture on the screen shows what is known as characteristic dishwater pus. It's literally the color of dirty dishwater. It has a very foul, smelling, uh, foul smell to it as well. The picture in the middle is just just to illustrate really what the extent of the infection was just 36 hours later. And then if you look at the rightward picture, he, he required multiple surgical debridements, and multiple washouts, skin grafting, and is now going to need months of intensive physical therapy to regain full use of his hand. So of course what we're talking about uh, to start off with is necrotizing fasciitis. This is a misnomer uh, in the media, but it's referred to commonly as flesh-eating bacteria. It's simply a very aggressive infection that spreads easily along the fascial planes. And uh, there are three types. Type 1 is the most common, so that's polymicrobial. So you get your, it's still most commonly staph and strep, but you're going to get gram-negative involvement too, including pseudomonas and anaerobes as well. Type 2 is single organism. That's about 15% of cases. Most commonly, it's group A strep, but there are also uh, reports of MRSA or Vibrio vulnificus, which are found in shellfish. And finally, type 3 is your classical clostridial gas gangrene. What I think is striking about this disease process is the mortality rate. More than a quarter of these patients die despite uh, early and aggressive uh, treatment. So I think the key here is not so much what the treatment is. That's quite straightforward. But the key is if we can reduce this mortality rate, it's going to be done by making this diagnosis earlier and not missing potential cases. What do the guidelines tell us about necrotizing infections? Well, they're incredibly vague. They basically ask you to act if you suspect necrotizing infections or if there are signs of systemic toxicity. I think we've all seen many cases of cellulitis where there's maybe some systemic signs where you just treat them with oral antibiotics, so a little bit vague. The management, of course, is very straightforward, which is broad-spectrum antibiotic therapy and uh, early surgical consultation for debridement. So you might be asking yourself, well, is there anything in the literature that's maybe been reported that might aid me in making this diagnosis so I don't miss patients who have necrotizing infections? What about this thing called the Alvernax score? That's come up and, is, and continues to come up in the literature. So the Alvernax score is a laboratory risk indicator for necrotizing fasciitis. And I think it's very important to, to show you this paper because this is the original derivation and uh, validation uh, study um, using the Alvernax score. And so this was a retrospective observational cohort where they basically had two groups. They looked at all cases of necrotizing infection and then they had a secondary group which they determined was severe cellulitis. The definition of severe cellulitis here was simply uh, uh, impression of severity as documented on the chart, requiring 48 hours or more of IV antibiotics, or requiring surgical debridement. And so it's also important to point out that the validation and the derivation cohorts were done at separate hospitals in this study. This is the actual LRNX score itself, and I think it's uh, important to take some time to just discuss some of the elements of this score. In terms of interpretation, if you're five or less, you are low risk, and if you're eight or greater, you're considered high risk for a necrotizing infection. I think there are some limitations with the score itself. If you look at the white blood cell count, for example, it does not reflect the fact that you can be septic and, in fact, leukopenic, so that's one limitation. If you look at the bottom four parameters, you can see that, basically, if you use a simple intervention such as IV fluid resuscitation, a lot of those parameters will actually change. And so I think that limit, limits the performance of this score as well. So that's just taking it at face value. These six parameters were uh, derived using some logistic regression methods to see what they felt were highly associated with necrotizing infection. So this is an ROC curve, and as a refresher, or, and for the junior residents, in an ideal setting, uh, in a rock curve, you want the highest sensitivity and specificity for your test, and so the top left-hand corner is where you want to see. And so just from a visual perspective, that looks quite impressive uh, in terms of the performance of the LRNX score. At a cutoff value of 6, the positive predictive value was 92%, the negative predictive value was 96%. So certainly, uh, the results appear impressive. Yep. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah, so the first limitation was it was retrospective, right? So they actually went back, and then they selected patients who had severe cellulitis as sort of a control group. Now, the definition of severe cellulitis there was a bit fudgy as well in the sense that it was as documented on the chart. So if the clinician wrote severe or something that indicated that, they would include that in their group. So it is hard to say exactly what that comparative group was. <clears throat> Moving on further, uh, looking at the results, this, the y-axis here is the probability for necrotizing infection. The x-axis is your score. The blue circle highlights that uh, at a score of five or less, or if you're low risk, you have a less than 50% chance of a necrotizing infection. I think we can all agree that's not really a safe bet. And the red circle shows that at a score of eight or higher, so high risk, you had a more than 80% chance of a necrotizing infection. Um, and so, again, these are sort of the cutoff values that they described. The authors further put towards a potential clinical pathway to approach these patients. I circled the blue box because that's what we really care about as clinicians. We care about those equivocal cases where it's not quite clear if it's truly a necrotizing infection or not. So the authors recommend that you use the LRNX score. <clears throat> and if you have intermediate or high risk, that you can do a few things. You can order, order uh, um, urgent MRI. Or you could do something called a finger test. Is anybody familiar with what the finger test is? Anybody? Um, I think it's important to talk about because this is used in many emergency departments um, across the world. And so the finger test is basically uh, giving some local anesthesia. You make a two centimeter incision with a scalpel down to the level of the deep fascia. And then with a finger, you just dissect the fascia itself. If there's easy dissection, a lack of bleeding, or the presence of this dishwater pus that I mentioned, and that's highly indicative of a necrotizing infection. So it's just something else that you might want to consider adding to your armamentarium for these uh, patients. So there are certainly some limitations. Dr. Viancourt alluded to the, uh, and we just discussed that, uh, you know, it was a retrospective design. There were some limitations with how they defined who was severe cellulitis. I've already highlighted that there were some problems with the indices and some interpretation issues. And finally, they don't really tell you when to calculate the LRNX score. So should you actually be, be calculating the score at the very beginning prior to any intervention? Should you be actually using serial scores? Uh, they don't really say, and so I think that limits the utility of this test. So I started to think to myself, well, okay, this is a great study from the critical care literature that's proposing a tool that supposedly has good performance um, to rule out necrotizing infection. Is there anything in the emergency department literature that's tried to validate this? And in fact, there was only one study I could find uh, and this is under review for publication. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Berner from the University of South Carolina was kind enough to get back to me in terms of the study details for this. This was a five-year study. Uh, I don't think we should really be critical of the sample size because it's an incredibly rare infection. But the bottom line to take away from this slide is that if you look at the sensitivity and the confidence intervals, this is something that would be unacceptable uh, for us uh, to be able to use in the emergency department to rule out an necrotizing infection. To further hammer home this point, uh, Michael Wilson uh, published a case report. This was a 37-year-old male with three days of left thigh pain. His vitals were stable, but he did have severe pain with any movement. It was a little bit unusual. They got an x-ray. No soft tissue gas was seen. They calculated his LRNX score, and it was zero. But, of course, they relied on their clinical judgment. And so, as you can see on the CT scan, the medial part of the left thigh has significant soft tissue gas confirming a necrotizing infection. And so I think the take-home points here are that necrotizing infections remain a clinical diagnosis, that you should not use the RNX score to rule out a necrotizing infection, and that there are adjuncts available if you have a high degree of suspicion. You should consider using a finger test, and certainly ultrasound, CT, or MRI can be used as well. So let's move forward. Yep. Uh, so the CT scan was read as no significant soft tissue gas. That's exactly how it was read. And that's the, that's the point, right? The point of presenting that case is that this is a scary diagnosis that is often missed, right? That's, that's the scary part about it. Dr. Elder? Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I, you know, this is a very high mortality rate. So I would argue that if you have a high degree of suspicion, we should advocate for our patients and have the surgeons assess the patient at the bedside. Absolutely. Absolutely. The other thing to remember is that the surgeons can change. So it could be orthopedic surgery if it's a limb. It could be general surgery if it's closer to the abdomen. Mm -hmm. It could be urology if we're talking about fourniers. So it's, uh, yeah. you know, it's a mishmash of who you actually, actually end, up getting, yeah. end up getting. Absolutely. Okay. So let's move on to a second case here. This is a 32-year-old male who has hepatitis C. He is not an IV drug user, no other medical history presents with this uh, cellulitis or soft tissue infection on the leg and there's a little bit of a purulent head. You've taken Dr. Wu's ultrasound course and so you put an ultrasound probe on it and there's no drainable collection there. So no abscess, frankly. And your question is, is this MRSA? And if it is, what's the optimal choice of antibiotics? Are there, are there any trials that have uh, compared them? And what does the latest literature show regarding emerging therapies against MRSA? So I'll start off with just a bit of background information to show why this is an important disease process. The y-axis on the left side just represents the number of actual cases. The y-axis on the right side is the rate per 100,000. And this is in the Champlain Lynn, which is where the Ottawa Hospital sits. So as you can see, in the early 90s, the rates were almost undetectable. And somewhere in the, in the late 90s to uh, mid-2000s, the rate has increased exponentially. The data is only as current as 2008, but I think we can surmise that if we extrapolate further, these numbers are just continuing to grow. We wonder what the MRSA burden is. It's like astronomical in some U.S. communities. So in some places in the U.S., they have more than a 75% incidence of MRSA, which is extremely high. The prevalence in Canada is actually unknown because it is not a reportable disease. Specific to the Ottawa Hospital Emergency Department, for culturable skin and soft tissue infections that end up being uh, staph aureus, 18% are MRSA, so we're almost a fifth. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is what actually are the risk factors for MRSA? And so Dr. Sue was one of the authors on this paper, and uh, this is great because it's specific to our emergency departments at both the uh, civic and the general campus. And so this was a retrospective case control design where they basically wanted to identify what are the risk factors associated with community-acquired MRSA. And so these are the results. Uh, as you can see here, um, there are several risk factors associated with MRSA, and I think this is a very high yield slide. This is something that we should uh, be considering in patients that present with purulent infections. You'll notice that the confidence intervals are wide, but that's owing to a, a small sample size for this study. This is again another high yield slide for any kind of rural college uh, exam question, but they could ask you, well, what are antibiotics effective against MRSA? And certainly there's some crossover there as things like linazolid and clindamycin come in IV formulations. What I'm gonna specifically talk to you about is a landmark trial that came out this year directly comparing clindamycin versus Septra. And then I'm gonna talk about some novel emerging therapies, so dalbavancin and aritavancin, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about what they are and why I think it's important to discuss them. So the first study was uh, published in March of this year in the New England Journal, and this was clindamycin going head-to-head -head with Septra. There, the rationale for the study is that there's actually been no trials effectively comparing uh, commonly used antibiotics for skin and soft tissue infections for efficacy and safety. Uh, so um, basically, if you were randomized to the Septra group, you got a placebo in between to keep the study blinded. 30% of the population was pediatric. This study and the next two studies, I'll just point out that 30% of patients, and they capped it at that, uh, had abscesses, which again, if you're a purist, you would argue that, well, why include them? Because you should just be treating uh, with incision and drainage. So it's just important to point out. They did exclude uh, some important characteristics, and I'll, I'll allude to this a little bit later on, but uh, they excluded febrile patients and your obese, CKD, diabetic patients, et cetera, and if you had cellulitis in certain locations. 
The primary outcome was clinical cure, and so this was at seven to 10 days after finishing antibiotics. And as you can see here, they had a, a rigid definition of what constituted a lack of a clinical cure. Patients were followed up 48 hours after finishing antibiotics at day 12, seven to 10 days after finishing antibiotics for the primary outcome, and then again, again at day 40 to make sure that there were no further complications. So these patients had excellent follow-up. The results are as follows. On the left-hand side, you can see the intention to treat population, and then they also did a per-protocol analysis on the right. And as you can see, there's basically no difference between, between uh, clindamycin and septra. It's also, uh, you might ask yourself, what were the adverse events? And so 10% of patients in both groups had diarrhea, 1% to 2% had nausea and vomiting. So again, there were really no significant differences in terms of adverse effects. What I care about, though, is a cellulitis-only subgroup, right? So what happens if we exclude patients with abscesses? And again, you can see that there's absolutely no difference between the two. So what it appears is, is that if you're thinking about which antibiotic to use optimally, the, the studies will tell you that they're equivocal. Uh, in, at the, in the Ottawa area, at least, if you look at our antibioticogram, um, the, the uh, rate of resistance with clindamycin is a little bit higher for Staph aureus, so we're, it's only about 80% effective. So I would argue if you're thinking between the two, you should use Septra, uh, and I think you should also, also highly consider doxycycline as well. The study had many strengths. It was the first prospective high-quality trial that's comparing two commonly used antibiotics for skin and soft tissue infections. And what I really liked about it is they included all age groups. It was not just limited to the adult population. Uh, there are some limitations. Not all patients were from the emergency department setting, which limits the generalizability. And again, there was this argument that why did they include such a significant percentage of patients that had abscesses? And I think the biggest point is they really excluded the prototypical patient. When you see a patient with cellulitis, they're often obese, have chronic kidney disease, have diabetes, and maybe have a fever. And so I, I think that limits uh, the power of the study as well. So let's move a little bit forwards now in terms of what are some novel emerging therapies. And so we're talking about dalbavancin and aritavancin. Dalbavancin has already been approved in the U.S. in May of last year, and they are going to be currently going under review in Canada for approval. So these are coming, and I think they have the potential to revolutionize the way we manage skin and soft tissue infections. So in terms of uh, structure, they're simply semi-synthetic analogs of uh, pre-existing antibiotics. Their mechanism allows them to be bactericidal. What's fascinating is the half-life is two weeks. These, these are really, really long half-lives for, for drugs. Uh, but the beauty is the dose. So aritavancin especially, you can just give as a one-time dose, and that is it. The cost, uh, I thought it was important to point out. You might think it's prohibitive, but we'll talk about why that might not be exactly the case. And this is a very important slide as well. This is a preamble to these two studies. And in an effort to standardize uh, randomized trials that are going to be looking at cellulitis in the future, they've come up with a rigid definition of what that is. And so if you have cellulitis or an abscess or a wound infection, it's 75 square centimeters at least, which allows you to be eligible for these studies. So that's going to help in the future when we start to pool these studies for meta-analyses. So let's look at the first study, and this is once-weekly dalbavancin going head-to-head -head with vancomycin and linezolid. We, the rationale for the study is that MRSA is an emerging challenge. Uh, it's basically uh, uh, increasing in burden uh, and also is leading to increased uh, cost due to hospitalization as well. So the objective was to determine the efficacy of dalbavancin, and this was a non-inferiority trial with an NI margin of 10%. And what they did is they basically pooled two trials that were identically designed, the DISCOVER trials. And so these are just some of the salient points about the DISCOVER trials, but basically DISCOVER 1 had a slightly sicker proportion of patients. And this was a massive study. I mean, this, these are a huge number of centers in these studies. Uh, these studies were carried out in Canada, uh, the U.S., and all over Europe as well. You were eligible if you met the FDA definition for an infection, and the clinician felt that you required at least three days of IV antibiotics. So more than 1,000 patients were randomized. And if you were in the Dalbavancin group, you got two doses, one at day one, one at day eight, and placebo all the way through. And if you were in the vancomycin group, you required at least three days of vancomycin, at which point the clinician could choose at his, his or her discretion uh, to step down to linezolid. The primary outcome here was early clinical response. In my opinion, not really that important to me as a clinician. So that was basically spread uh, of erythema stops and the patient's afebrile at two to three days. I think what was more important was the secondary outcome of investigator impression. And so that was at seven to 10 days, or sorry, at 10 to 14 days, 
had the infection sufficiently resolved. I think that's what we care about and I think that's what patients care about. So if you look at the results here, I put together a table to illustrate them. No difference in the primary outcome. No difference if you looked at just the subgroup of cellulitis and no difference in investigator impressions. So it appears from this trial uh, that indeed dalbavancin is non-inferior to vancomycin and linezolid. Uh, this had major strengths. This was a huge sample size, multinational, uh, certainly helps with generalizability and very strong methodology. Uh, but there were some limitations. I, I would criticize the choice of their primary outcome. I think, you know, today when we're designing trials, it's much more important and much more powerful to pick outcomes that are more patient important. Um, they had a sicker population, and what I mean by that is that these were all patients that ended up being admitted to hospital. This is not an ideal medication if you're going to hospitalize them anyway, but this could be a dream medication for those patients that you're going to manage as outpatients. There's also some arguments, and there were some interesting editorials written about the cost. Is it prohibitive, and are, are there going to be issues of resistance? And I'll touch on that uh, shortly. So we'll move on to that second trial I wanted to discuss, and this is a SOLA1 trial. And this compared aridavancin, which is technically even better because it's just one dose, head-to-head -head against vancomycin. Again, this was multi-center, carried out in the U.S., India, uh, Mexico, and all over Europe. So this was, again, almost 1,000 patients were randomized. And if you were in the aridavancin group, you got one dose and then placebo for the duration of your therapy. The, clini the clinicians could decide the duration of therapy, whether that was seven or 10 days. In this case, the primary outcome was a composite. So you, had to, you could have either one of these three outcomes to make up your primary outcome at 48 to 72 hours. But again, I would argue it's that secondary uh, outcome, which is did you as a clinician feel that this infection got sufficiently better, uh, which was more important. So if you look at the results here, Again, no difference with the primary outcome, no difference if you just looked at patients with cellulitis, and no difference with investigator impression. So you can argue again that aritavancin uh, appears to be non-inferior to vancomycin. I'll point out uh, just at this point that uh, both of these trials were uh, pharmaceutical industry sponsored. I don't think that's necessary, necessarily a limitation, but something to be aware of. Uh, so, again, strong methodology, uh, good generalizability, but I would criticize the use of the composite outcome. Whenever you see a study with composite outcomes, you want to know what those individual component numbers were, and they never reported them. So I don't know exactly what was driving the results. Again, these were all inpatients, which is understandable. These are efficacy trials, but I think the next step is to look at these drugs in the outpatient setting to see how effective they are. And there were some, some, some uh, similar criticisms as the previous trial regarding resistance and cost. So I'm just going to take a minute to actually talk about some of the pros and cons. There's a big debate about uh, how useful they're going to be and are they going to actually revolutionize the way we treat these infections. A big pro is that you can manage these patients as outpatients. So you can give them that single dose and then they're on their way. Whereas a cost could, be, uh, cost could certainly be prohibitive. Uh, so the average cost is going to be anywhere from two to 3,000 US dollars. But you can argue that if you're going to treat them as outpatients, then you're actually going to save money uh, by avoiding hospitalization costs and avoiding things like nursing care, CCAC, et cetera. So that's one positive. There were a low number of adverse events in both of these trials, something like 1% to 2%. But there's certainly this concern that imagine being injected with a drug with a half-life of two weeks and you have a serious reaction to it. How would you even approach that? Uh, like an epi infusion for a week? I don't know. It's just something to think about. The other thing is it can certainly improve the quality of life of patients. Imagine getting one dose of IV antibiotics. You don't need to come back to the eMERGE. You don't need to go to an OPAC clinic. You don't have to wait around at home for your dose of IV antibiotics. It would certainly improve your quality of life. But a limitation is that you cannot step down. So let's say the culture results come back and it's actually MSSA. Well, you now can't step them down to Keflex. You've already given them this drug. A big pro is that you don't need indwelling catheters uh, for these patients, uh, which uh, certainly carries their own uh, set of complications. And uh, a con is that you could possibly miss complications. We just went over a case of necrotizing fasciitis, and so what if this patient actually has a necrotizing infection and they're sent home and not seen for several days? So that's a concern. And then the biggest debate is resistance versus compliance. I would argue this is the dream drug in your patient who's non-compliant. Your IV drug user, your homeless patient who you know is not going to finish their course of antibiotics, this is the drug to give them. Uh, however, there's the argument that it, because of the half-life being two weeks, this drug spends a significant amount of time at a concentration under the MIC, which is the minimum inhibitory concentration, and that allows the bacteria ample time uh, to, to develop resistance. However, 
If you're not compliant with antibiotics, that also confers uh, resistance as well, so you can argue that it actually will lower resistance. So it's still up for debate in terms of what will actually happen. Dr. Beck? That's an excellent point, I, I agree. Uh, however, there's no universally accepted definition of what a treatment failure is, and I think clinicians need to come together, researchers, to develop that definition, and that should really then be the primary outcome for many of these studies, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's move on to uh, the final case, and so this is a 42-year-old female, diabetic, hypertensive. Vitals are unremarkable except for a low-grade fever. And you may be left asking yourself, should I treat with IV antibiotics or oral antibiotics? This is the most fascinating question. And um, the other question you might ask yourself is, well, if I'm going to use IV antibiotics, should they maybe wait in our CDU? It's 2 a.m. at a night shift. Should I just hold them and maybe reassess them in the morning? Should I admit them to hospital, or can I send them home? So uh, this uh, first study is by Volz and colleagues, and this looked at ED observation units. And so these are very similar to what we have at the Ottawa Hospital, which is CDUs. And so what they wanted to do is look at what are the predictors of failure for ED observation unit stay. In other words, what's the utility of holding a patient in the emergency department for these infections before making a disposition decision? And this was a retrospective cohort study. 30% of patients that they sort of CDU'd ended up being admitted anyway. I've highlighted some uh, sort of interesting points, and that is if you were an IV drug user, immunocompromised or diabetic, you actually were not more likely to be admitted. And also, if you had a prior course of oral antibiotics, you were more, not more likely to be admitted. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, using logistic regression, they identified three predictors uh, for admission, and this was as follows. If you were febrile, had an elevated lactate, or cellulitis of the hand. So that's what they felt were most likely associated with a patient ending up being admitted. I think a strength of this paper is that it addresses an important question. What exactly is the utility of holding this patient uh, in the CDU or the ED observation unit? Um, and this is important because, you know, talking to Dr. Sue and she agrees, cellulitis often stays the same or in fact worsens once you start uh, empiric antibiotic therapy. So what exactly is the utility? There's some limitations. Um, they excluded important factors because this study was limited by the charting of the emergency physician, which isn't always optimal. The uh, duration uh, of stay or the doses of antibiotics were unknown, and that's a big uh, negative because one patient might have stayed in their observation unit for four hours, and another one might have stayed for 12 hours, and that would certainly affect your disposition decision. We also don't know the outcomes. We don't know who came back to hospital when you sent them home uh, with a treatment failure. And two key populations were not assessed, so it would be nice if they compared this population to those directly admitted to hospital and those directly sent home. So the take-home point from that study is that a high percentage of these patients are admitted from the ED observation unit. I would argue that clinical decision units are of limited value for skin and soft tissue infections. That once you see a patient, you should just make a decision. You're either going to admit this patient or send them home, and if they're going home, it's IV or oral antibiotics. You just have to make that decision at that time. Uh, so it leads to an important question, though, is when exactly should these patients be reassessed? And so this is from my resident research project. This is a national survey to CAPE members and to members of the AMMI, which is the Infectious Disease Body in Canada. And shockingly, most uh, emergency physicians feel that you should be reassessing these patients at 24 hours. And I think that totally contradicts what we know about the natural disease process and how cellulitis responds to antibiotics in the first one to two days. So I would argue that we should perhaps be uh, reassessing these patients if they are to come back to the emergency department uh, beyond three days. So uh, this next paper I'm going to talk to you about is by Talon and colleagues, uh, published in December of last year. And so they wanted to look at, well, what exactly influences an emergency doctor's decision to admit these patients? Uh, and so this was a prospective study done at 12 emergency departments, and you were eligible if you were an adult with acute symptoms. And so emergency physicians had to fill out from a structured list what was the reason for admitting uh, uh, the patient to hospital. 
So I've highlighted the three most common reasons. So I think my patient has significant underlying comorbidities. I think my, pers uh, my patient needs uh, surgical intervention. Or overwhelmingly, it was that I think this patient needs IV antibiotics. That was the most common reason for admitting these patients. The admission rate was 15.2%. What I think is really interesting is the rate of serious adverse events. They looked at all patients admitted to the hospital for cellulitis. Who had a serious adverse event? It was two patients. They were both diabetic. Both ended up in the ICU and required an amputation. Both had significant soft tissue gas uh, on radiography, so they had necrotizing infections. So very, very small adverse event rate. <coughs> they also identified five factors that were associated with being hospitalized. So if you were febrile, had a large wound, uh, any comorbidity, a history of failed treatment, or if you were elderly. So there are some strengths of this paper. It was a prospective data collection. And they attempted to determine exactly why emergency doctors choose to admit these patients, which I think is a, a very interesting question. However, some factors were not taken into account. I think we all agree that there are many social factors that uh, play a part when we decide whether a patient has to come into hospital. Can they cope at home? Do they have access to a family physician, et cetera? This uh, study is actually a sub-study of a larger trial that's coming out uh, that's looking specifically at abscesses. And so one limitation was uh, overwhelmingly most patients had purulent uh, skin and soft tissue infections. And the question remains unanswered. Why exactly do, do emergency doctors feel that uh, patients need IV therapy? The take home point from this trial is that the need for IV antibiotics is certainly the most commonly cited reason for admission. But once you admit these patients, the rate of really serious adverse events is extremely small. I think is sort of an acceptable miss rate there at 0.5%. This is also for my resident research project. And so this is physician opinion, but in our national survey, what emergency doctors and infectious disease specialists felt were predictors of failure with oral antibiotics. In other words, we feel, in our opinion, that these factors are the reasons why we, sh we should be starting patients on IV antibiotics. And so this is yet to be actually studied. The final paper I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, by Danny Peterson and colleagues. Pretty impressive, actually, because this was his resident research project, a prospective observational cohort involving almost 500 patients. And they realized that you know, there's no universally uh, accepted definition for treatment failure, for severity of cellulitis, and no clinical decision tools to guide physicians on whether to admit and what route of antibiotic therapy to give. And so they wanted to look at what are risk factors for treatment failure uh, with antibiotics. And this was like two Canadian emergency departments in London. So what's the definition of treatment failure? Again, there's no universally accepted definition. What they came up with was that you either ended up being hospitalized for your infection or you failed initial antibiotics, meaning you needed a change in class of your antibiotics or a step up from oral to IV therapy. Uh, and I would argue that that's a pretty reasonable definition. There are two important things to take away from this study flow here. One is that uh, the majority of patients seen in their emergency department end up with some form of IV antibiotic therapy, which is kind of interesting. The second thing, and I think this is fascinating, is the treatment failure rate. The treatment failure rate overall in this study was 20.5%. The treatment failure rate in our hospital in a study done by Dr. Steele and Dr. Murray in 2004 was 18%. What that tells me is that over the last 10 years, remarkably, the treatment failure rate has basically been unchanged. And I think there's ample area for research to try and improve those numbers. In terms of the results, they identified using logistic regression five predictor variables that predicted failure with either oral or IV antibiotic therapy, and so they're listed on the screen for you. I think this is important in the sense that these are some factors that you should maybe be considering when you're making your disposition uh, decisions for these patients. This had many strengths. This was the largest prospective study addressing potential risk factors for treatment failure. It's Canadian data, and they also performed a sensitivity analysis which showed that the results are robust. There are some limitations. Reassessment times were variable, and patients were reassessed by different emergency physicians. So that limits some of the, the um, or at least muddies the results, but you can argue that that's actually real world practice in the emergency department. And finally, I think the biggest point is they did not address the optimal route of antibiotic therapy. So I don't care so much who's going to fail antibiotics, period, but who's going to fail oral antibiotic therapy, because I think that will then guide you in terms of who needs IV therapy. So the take-home point from this study is that the treatment failure rate, remarkably, has been basically unchanged. It's around 20% in Canada. Risk factors have been identified, and I think we should consider them for treatment failure as outpatients. And the question about optimal route of antibiotic therapy does remain unanswered.
So from what I've shown you today about skin and soft tissue infections in the emergency department, perhaps there are more questions than answers. In fact, I would argue that there are several critical questions that require answering. Who actually needs IV antibiotic therapy? Who can I actually send home as an outpatient versus, ad versus admit to the hospital? And when exactly should these patients be optimally reassessed? And in order to really understand that, you have to know what the epidemiology of skin and soft tissue infections is. And I was quite shocked to learn in my literature review that this hasn't been adequately described and certainly not in a prospective fashion and not in Canada. So I'm going to briefly talk about the OPAC clinic at the Ottawa Hospital. This is important for us to all know. Dr. Sue is the current director and she's always open to questions if you have any. I can direct them to her. Um, in the first six months, they estimate that they saw approximately 250 patients, but that by their estimations is only about 15% of eligible patients. So I would uh, really stress to you that unless there's some transportation issues for patients, please refer them to the OPAC clinic if you're going to start them on IV antibiotics. Do not have them come back to the emergency department for reassessments. The clinic runs Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, although they will be expanding days once the numbers increase. And if your, pa if your patients are curious, the average time to follow up right now as it stands is about four days. So this leads to uh, some upcoming research. So I'd just like to take uh, just a moment to talk about uh, my thesis project that will be coming out in July of next year. So I, am to, uh, I aim to conduct the first prospective observational cohort study to describe the epidemiology of cellulitis in this important subset of, of patients. We're going to look at all comers, all adults coming to the emergency department with skin and soft tissue infections. And our primary outcome is going to be treatment failure at 14 days. Now, we understand there's no universal definition. Ours will be at the 14-day mark, they'll get a telephone call or we'll get the uh, data from the OPAC clinic. And it was basically that at 72 hours, did you need a change in class of antibiotics owing to progression of infection? Did you need a step up from oral to IV antibiotics owing to progression of infection, so not due to allergy or intolerance? Uh, or did you need subsequent admission to hospital, uh, to hospital uh, for your skin and soft tissue infection? So that's what our definition is as it currently stands. Dr. Sue has very kindly allowed me to uh, change the OPAC consult sheet, so there will be some added questions in there, and it will also serve as my data collection sheet. But don't worry, it won't be as complicated as the stroke referral form. Uh, one question we will be asking, though, is that if you select parenteral therapy, we're going to ask you, why did you decide to use IV antibiotic therapy? This has actually never been assessed, certainly not in a prospective fa uh, fashion, and I think it's a fascinating question. So in summary today, I hope that uh, I've been able to uh, stress to you that the evidence for optimal management is, is certainly lacking for skin and soft tissue infections. That is actually a more complex disease process than we think. That necrotizing infections remain a clinical diagnosis, that you should not rely on any scoring systems to rule it out. That uh, MRSA is continuing to be a, in a, an increasing burden. I've highlighted specific risk factors to patients in our emergency department and also discuss some novel uh, therapies that are emerging for MRSA. And I've just briefly touched on what the OPAC clinic is, what it can do for our patients, and some upcoming research that I hope will answer uh, the questions that I posed today. Thank you. Dr. Greenberg. Um, 